And now we're going to continue with our parasites, and I want to. I'm going to again go over the the fleas and lice pretty quickly, because my feeling is that we've talked about those pretty well uh, in the lecture. Remember that the the fleas are in the the order Siphonoptera. They're laterally compressed. Now, what did the video say? Why are they laterally compressed? Yeah, it makes the it's easier to run through the fur of your host animal if it's laterally compressed. The adults have piercing sucking mouth parts and feed on blood. Uh, and again, if you remember the, the uh, video that uh, the cat flea generally will have about 20 feeding bouts every day. And if you've got a cat or a dog that's allergic to those bites, they're just going to be scratching and, and itching uh, in, in a frenzy uh, from that. But it, they can also get on you, can be very unpleasant. Remember that the, the larvae are somewhat maggot-like, but they do have a head capsule so that we can tell that they're not true maggots. They feed primarily on decaying debris. Uh, and so if you're one of those kinds of, of homes where you eat a lot of munchies on the couch and, and you uh, drop a lot of the, the crumbs and things in the couch and your pet dog or cat sits right beside you at the same time, uh, you're providing lots of food for those flea larvae. But as indicated in the video, all flea larvae have to have at least one blood meal. Where are they getting that blood? Remember that the adult flea takes in more blood than it needs to digest and it actually excretes little droplets of blood which dry and fall off of the host animal and it's those blood pellets that the larvae have to, to pick up. We also talked about the life cycle. Uh, this life cycle, the most common species is the cat flea, whether it's on a dog, a human, uh, a, a squirrel, rat, or, or a cat. Uh, that's the most common one that we have in our domestic areas here uh, in, in North America. Generally, the, the flea life cycle from egg uh, through the pupa can take as, as little as uh, about three and a half weeks. And, and so uh, if you've got an adult, uh, flea that's the, as it's stated here that's laying 25 to 40 eggs per day uh, over a, a couple of month periods you could have hundreds of fleas in, in no time at all and so this is something that, that again you can't kind of wait until the animal has fleas and so forth me uh, to me you really need to prevent fleas in this case make sure that the, the cats and dogs have preventing materials on them <coughs> historically uh, fleas have, have been our most important uh, uh, disease carrying pest. Uh, they carried the black plague. Uh, the, and, and when human beings would get the black plague, uh, they would get it from a flea bite, uh, a rat flea bite in this case. Uh, and then what would happen is that uh, the, the black plague can be transmitted by the flea and, and what you'll get is in that particular case is you'll just get the plague but when human beings get it they get what is called bubonic plague. Now most of you don't know what buboes are but in your groin area uh, are a couple of very large lymph glands uh, and, and when you would get this uh, bacterium in your body it would clog those lymph glands up and you would get these two big swollen areas in your groin and those were called buboes and, and so that's a bubonic plague uh, and, and uh, uh, that would be the normal plague that you would get from that but if the plague eventually got up into the lung area where you would start coughing and hacking, uh, then we would get what we call pneumonic plague. And human beings would spread the, the plague to each other by sneezing, coughing, and, and expelling uh, the, the plague bacillus uh, with their sputum and, and uh, mucus uh, in there. Pretty nasty uh, disease. Uh, you know, there's plenty of records that back in the Middle Ages in the 14, 15, 1600s where we had outbreaks that up to 80% of a population in a particular town could die uh, within a month. And, and uh, of course, the, the people at that time didn't know what was going on. Uh, and so they blamed it on they weren't living right, that God was taking uh, vengeance upon them and, and so forth. But now we know that, no, that they had a rat population. The rats uh, had picked up the disease, transmitted it to, to themselves. Uh, and by the way, plague is an equal opportunity disease. It kills not only the rat, 
it kills the flea and it will kill human beings uh, and, and so it's uh, to uh, you know to me uh, uh, epidemiologically it's a bad uh, disease because it kills all the hosts off that's why plague would also often die down uh, plague would, would run its course all those people that seem to be able to tolerate the plague or, or didn't get infected uh, once it was over with there was no more plague around because there were no more rats no more fleas and no more people that were susceptible uh, we also see typhus uh, being transmitted by fleas we've already talked about uh, flea larvae uh, and pupae can, can serve as the intermediate host uh, for tapeworms. There are lots of fleas around, uh, but again, the, the cat flea is, is the most common one. We do occasionally get dog, rat, and human fleas. There are other species, uh, but they're, they're much less common. We've also talked about control. Remember, it's a three-prong control. Sanitation, trying to remove all the, the eggs, larvae, pupae, and, and uh, those, those little blood pellets that we can. Most importantly, treat the pet, and then if we do think that we need to treat for the larval control, we need controls for those. But I do want to spend a little bit more time on the bed bug. Uh, and, and by the way, one of our students in one of the labs has already contacted me and, and said that they believe they found bed bugs in their apartment, and, and uh, uh, she wouldn't have known what they looked like if they hadn't seen them in the laboratory. So uh, hopefully this this is doing some good uh, for you. Important thing about bed bugs, really interesting, is that we have never implicated bed bugs of transmitting any diseases. That's also a problem. And the problem is, is that all the health departments only deal with insects if they have the potential of transmitting diseases. So for the longest time when we were having this bed bug outbreak here in North America, we could never get either the state health departments or the local health departments to do anything about it, to, to give out information, to work with people that had these problems. They said, well, you got bed bugs. I'm sorry. That's not our deal. And, uh, but uh, over the last couple of years, uh, most of the state health departments and most of the municipal health departments have now realized that they need to get in here, not, only because, not because they don't don't transmit diseases, but when people have a heavy infestation of these, uh, they do intense itching and scratching, and they're starting to, to have outbreaks of various types of skin diseases. And, and so, not caused by the bed bug, but secondarily from that itching and, and scratching can cause infections from those. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Uh, and, and the answer to the next question is yes. Uh, in my travels, uh, I've encountered three hotels that uh, they, they assigned me a room, and after I did my inspection, I went back to the counter and said, uh, I found this bed bug in my room. Uh, I need you to find me another room. Uh, and I prefer a room as far away from this room as you can get me. Uh, and so far, I haven't found bed bugs in the second room, but I always tell them, if I find bed bugs in the second room, I'm out of here. Uh, and, and, uh, but I know some other entomologists that have done that, that they've actually found bed bugs in two of the rooms that, that they've been assigned. Oops. Now, again, we can't emphasize enough. Having bed bugs does not mean that you're a bad housekeeper. It does not mean that you're a bad person. Uh, you're living in squalor and the rest of that. The only thing the bed bug is concerned about is, are you still alive and do you have blood? That, that's all they're concerned about. And, and they don't care if you're rich or poor. As a matter of fact, most of the contacts that I get are from my fairly well-to-do friends that, that know that I know something about this. And, and uh, uh, I think the latest one that I had uh, lived over here in, in a pretty nice neighborhood in Dublin. And he was just embarrassed as could be that he came home with bed bugs, but he does an awful lot of traveling. And, and so I've talked to him now about how to, to not uh, bring those home again. Remember, bed bugs cannot fly. They can move pretty quickly. Uh, and, and so, especially at nighttime, it's really interesting. Bed bugs have infrared sensors 
that means they can detect your body heat. And, and we've had some cases where we've actually isolated beds. We put uh, bed posts in little pans of water, which the sort of little moats so the bed bugs couldn't crawl across it. And what the bed bugs did in some of those situations is they went up the wall, went up to the ceiling, and dropped. <laughs> because they said, I, I, I sense the, the heat down there. I'm going to drop down to where that heat. They're pretty really interesting little rascals uh, in there. Uh, they have little claws on their feet uh, and they prefer sort of rough textured surfaces uh, to hide on. They, uh, that's why I put my, as I indicated, that's why I put my suitcase in, in the bathtub uh, so, because I know that they can't crawl out of the, that bathtub if I seem to, to uh, bring them in. They're excellent hitchhikers. Uh, we find them most commonly on, on backpacks and luggage, uh, but they'll get on purses. Kids that have bed bugs at home often bring them in the book binding of their books when they take their books. And one of the things that we're recommending, we've got a couple of school districts here in Columbus that have pretty severe bed bug infestations, and we try to train the, the teachers to train their kids to get some uh, Ziploc bags, some uh, like uh, uh, two gallon bags that are, are big enough for this. And what what they're going to do is they're going to put their books in those bags to take them home. When they take them out at home and use them, after they're through using them, they go right back into the bag. And, and that way we don't want the book just sitting out in their rooms and, or, or at home because at nighttime the bed bugs could get into that. And then if they bring them into the school, the school has them also. Do you see them? <laughs> Here's some luggage that was in an airplane, and you can see a couple of bed bugs up, up in here. Now, this luggage, I think, had probably been in storage for some period of time in an infested home uh, because there's some eggs on it, uh, and, and that normally wouldn't occur if you were uh, readily using that. But here you can just see a seam on, on the, the uh, luggage, and here's a couple of little bed bugs uh, hiding out in there. Now, how do they travel? Uh, they, they can uh, walk down the, the hallway uh, and uh, from one room to another. Uh, this is why when an apartment complex, when somebody finds bed bugs in a particular apartment complex, we always tell the pest management professionals they have to request access to all the apartments that surround that, not only on the same floor, but one floor up and one floor down. And the reason for that What's above this ceiling tile? Do you know? Pardon? Yeah, there's air vents. There's electrical wires, conduits, all kinds of, of infrastructure is above that. All of that infrastructure has to go through the walls at various locations. And in most buildings, they just chipped a hole in the wall to have that go through. So it's not tightly sealed. So if there's bed bugs in this room, they get in there, they run down that floor, and they can get to the next room without any problem. All motels are that way. All hotels are that way. Most apartment complexes are that same way, that all the infrastructure is connected. And, and so if you've got bed bugs in one room, it's a high probability that you will have bed bugs in the adjoining of apartments, whether it's above, below, or surrounding it. <coughs> Remember that the life cycle of the bed bug uh, is, is typical of the bugs. They have five nymphal uh, instars. Uh, the nymphs, and, and the interesting thing in this is that each instar only needs one complete meal. So if they're undisturbed and they have a complete blood meal, and, and a complete blood meal for these small nymphs might take as little as about five minutes to complete. Once they completely fill up their gut, the, and they'll fill up the crop first uh, with the blood. They'll run away from the body, find a little crack or crevice to hide, and over the next couple of days, they will undergo the molting process. When they do the molting process, guess what? Remember? What did they shed in the molting process? The exoskeleton, the lining of the foregut, and the lining of the hindgut, the tracheal tubes. So they basically void their gut of all contents. 
So now that they're in the second instar, they have to feed again. And so they will find a host. Again, if they can feed to what we call repletion and uh, completely feed, they'll go hide again, shed their exoskeleton. Now, if you disturb them, they may have to come back and feed a second time. But once they've completely filled their gut up with blood, they will molt. Then they'll come take another meal, and, and they'll continue doing that. Now, as adults, if they're adult females, when a female finishes feeding, she converts most of that blood meal into eggs. Okay? If it's a male, uh, the males usually only need one blood meal and may not feed all that frequently uh, because the, the males uh, use all of their blood meal energy to move around, try to find females that have recently fed and, and be mated. Each female gets mated after every complete blood meal. And so, uh, you know, she's going to take a blood meal. She's going to get mated. She'll produce eggs from that. Then she'll try to find her host again, have a blood meal. She'll get mated a, a second time and produce a second batch of eggs uh, with that. And so they can repeat that uh, dozens of times uh, as adults. How do we recognize uh, the, the uh, bed bugs uh, again? Uh, there's no definitive uh, uh, thing about the bites. They're, they're just sort of uh, uh, itchy spots. Everybody reacts to them differently. Some people don't react at all. Uh, those can be real problems because there are some people that live in apartment complexes that don't even know they've got bed bugs, and the bed bugs in their apartment are going to all the surrounding uh, apartments. Uh, most of the bites will occur where you've got exposed skin, uh, uh, primarily at nighttime, but if you're one of those that happens to fall asleep on the couch, uh, they're, they're going to be on your hands, around your neck, or if you've got shorts on, they could be on your legs and, and places like that. Normally, yeah. Uh, the question is, if I move into a new house, how do I know if I've got bed bugs or not? You don't. However, I'm going to talk about some ways that we can do some inspections in there and, and take a look for that. Uh, excellent question. When it comes to the, the symptomology for these, uh, what we're going to be looking for uh, to detect bed bugs, to me, the, the primary material is the fecal spot. Uh, when they take a blood meal and they leave a fecal spot behind, uh, that's a really telltale thing, but you may have to, to look for that a little bit. If there's an active infestation, there should be uh, either eggs or eggshells. There should be nymphs uh, and uh, adults around someplace for us to, to find. And how we're going to find those, we're going to look uh, primarily in, in all the secluded areas or the hidden areas. Uh, if you move into a furnished apartment that might have a bed or a couch, uh, I'm immediately going to go into that couch. I'm going to take all the cushions off, and I'm going to look around the seams of the cushions. I'm going to look where the cushions sit to see if I see any of the, the fecal spots or anything like that. If there's a bed, I'm going to take that, uh, not only the mattress, I'm going to take the mattress and flip it up turn it over and look on the underside it around the seams. I'm going to take the box spring and do the same thing. I'm going to pick that box spring up and, and pull it out. And likewise, I'm going to look at uh, where I pull all of that out, I'm going to look at all the framing that, that's on there. Because the, where the, the um, bed frames come together, there's often a little crack in there, and they, they might be in there. And the best tool that I've got to inspect cracks and crevices I actually keep a little plastic card, but I used to I used to uh, actually use biz my business card, but I kept tearing them up so much. But basically, what I would do is uh, this is just a little plastic card that I, I occasionally get at shows. And what I do with this one is that uh, if there are any cracks or crevices in, in the, the baseboard or something like that, or if I've got something like here, I'll take this card and just run it in like that. And what it will do is, if there's any bed bugs in there, that will shoo them out of there. And, and it'll make it pretty easy for me to, to check them out. Now, what do we do for travelers? Uh, again, uh, the first thing that I do when I go to a, a new hotel or motel, 
uh, just like when I get home, the first thing that I do is I go into the bathroom, pull the curtain back, and I look in the bathtub, make sure there's nothing in the bathtub, and I set my suitcase in there, I set my briefcase in there, and if I'm wearing a coat, I take my coat and put it in the bathtub. Then I go into where the bed area is, and just like in, in the video, I pull back the, now, if you're in the proper hotel, they should have changed all the sheets. So I'm usually not concerned about the sheets having any blood spots, but what I need to do is I need to pull the under sheet off, the, the base sheet, so I actually get to the mattress, and then I'll check the seam of the mattress primarily around the front. That's where most of the bed bugs are going to be. Most of the hotels and motels also have a backboard, or they may have a picture behind the bed that's stuck to the wall. You know, it's screwed to the wall. They don't want you to take it away. But that's where I take this card again and run it down in the little crack or crevice of that to see if there's anything there. Uh, if I don't find anything typically around the bed, uh, there's often an upholstered uh, couch or, or chair. I'll look in, in that also. Uh, then after I've, I've done all of, all of that stuff, uh, uh, I don't normally do the nightstand the rest of that because I usually if there's bed bugs in there they're going to be somewhere around the mattress or somewhere around the the upholstered chair or couch those are the two places they're going to be however I've got other ways that I deal with that here's the other things that I do I keep my clothing and actually I've gone to putting my clothing in larger Ziploc bags in my suitcase and I only take out the clothing that I need to and then my dirty clothing goes into another bag <laughs> uh, for that. Uh, I don't store my suitcase on the bed or floor it and, and actually I keep most of my, my suitcase, my uh, backpack and other things in the bathtub. Uh, you know, only when I'm using the bathtub to take a shower or something, I take it out of there. But after I'm done, I, I put everything uh, back in there. And, and so it's a, a really good place to store your things. Uh, now, I know the lady that does our bed bug, she actually has three smaller bags that she has. And I've started doing that. Uh, now, does everybody know what a ditty bag is? What guys' ditty bags are? That, that's that little zipper bag that we keep our toothbrushes and shaving items and, and things like that. Uh, I've gone to keeping that now in a plastic bag also. I only take it out, use it when I'm brushing my teeth or shaving, and then after I'm done I put it back in the Ziploc bag and that way nothing can get on it or in it or anything like that. When it comes to treatment options for this, uh, it used to be that we didn't have any insecticides because the uh, EPA took away all the insecticides that were effective for bed bugs. Uh, and and uh, so, but just over the last six months, there have been some new chemistry that's been developed. And guess what? Who can use the new chemistry? They're only for professionals. And, and so you as a homeowner, if you ever get bed bugs, we strongly recommend do not try to deal with bed bugs by yourself. You need to get a professional that has a license that has the ability to get some of these new insecticides that can be used for them. Unfortunately, we're seeing, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen it, uh, you pull up to a, a stoplight and over there is a little sign that says, got bed bugs, we can treat them in one whack, we use a heat treatment, bullshit. Uh, the, don't buy into those. I, uh, the, I, I chide uh, anybody that, that would call a number that you see on a, a billboard at the side of the road. Uh, you're you're going to get taken uh, by that. Uh, and, and now, with that said, we do know that properly used heat treatments can kill bed bugs. Properly used cold treatments can kill bed bugs. But again, you have to know exactly what you're doing. You have to have professional equipment in order to do that uh, correctly. And most of the companies that do heat treatments also use now these insecticides. They say we can get rid of most of them, but if we want to really be sure that we got rid of all of them, we need to put this insecticide down also. I uh, don't have time to, to cover mosquitoes, so uh, we'll stop here. We'll pick up mosquitoes next Tuesday. Did any of you have any questions on bed bugs?
I think that, that this is really the scourge that, that has come around recently. And, and uh, uh, let me also make a deal with you. Uh, I plan to be around for another four or five years. Uh, don't plan to die that quick. Uh, and so uh, even though you leave this course and go elsewhere, please, if you run into a, an insect problem in and around the home, feel free to contact me. Uh, uh, email's the best way that way, but most of you still have my phone number. I, it's amazing the number of, of uh, text messages I, I get every month from former students that say, you know, you may not remember me, and that's probably true, uh, but I was in your course, and can you help me with this critter? And, and so I'm, I'm more than willing to help you out with those.